from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. My name is Mehmet and in each episode, as you know, I cover different topics from emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, AI, cybersecurity, digital transformation, quantum computing, and also at the same time, recently I'm doing more interviews with subject matter experts, startup founders, and entrepreneurs. And here today I have Garrick who is joining me. Garrick, I would let you tell the audience where are you joining from and what you do. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mehmet. It's, uh, I'm happy to be here. And I'm calling in from the Philippines, though I'm originally from the, the USA. My uh, base is, is here in the Philippines. Um, and I'm a AI futurist and CEO of Valhalla.team. Uh, at Valhalla, we specialize in working with purpose-driven tech companies, helping them build out their development teams and their products while leveraging the power of AI. Uh, you could say our expertise lies at the intersection of AI, IQ, and EQ. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, in the first place, how did you first become interested in AI and what led you to become an AI futurist? So the uh, I think it all started when uh, I was quite young, as, as most things do. Uh, there was a, I, I was thinking about this guy, I get this question asked normally, and, and in the very beginning, my answer was kind of, uh, flat of like I, I don't know it just was always obvious like it was it was the thing I don't know what sparked it um but uh, I think I think it started you know same way that a lot of us kind of nerds get into things it was started with sci-fi started with the books we read and and uh, there was a book you know recursion um and it the, the more I dug into this idea of building intelligence from scratch the more I started to obsess over it on pretty much every level you can imagine um, because it strikes me as a very grand project that is really at the very tip of the iceberg of everything that it means to be human for the last you know many thousands of years you know where it's it's pushing the limits of our hardware it's pushing the limits of our philosophy it's pushing the limits of our ethics it's pushing the limits of our industry um, and it's it's all coming together in a way that just you know makes right now a very exciting time to be alive um and so i've uh yeah i've been been obsessing this for, for as long as i can remember it looks like a long uh, i would say obsession <laughs> i can see this also uh Garrick. now from what you are seeing what is the current state of ai and because you mentioned you work with a lot of uh, your customers to see how they can implement this so where do you think the future holes in terms of, you know, future of business and the impact on society. Yeah, there's there's a fantastic quote um, of the uh, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So so a lot of inc incredible innovations you know have have arrived. And um, I think where entrepreneurs are going to be making a lot of money is the same way that they've always made money, which is going to be on the cutting edge. Um, and they're mm -hmm. going to be playing arbitrage with the future. They're going to be figuring out where the puck is going, and they're going to be moving there, there first. And when I'm advising companies into thinking about how to predict you know, what's going to be happening with AI and where it's going, um, there, there's quite a few models I give them, but, but one that, that I want to share here uh, to get started with is that the, the closest analogy of where we are at right now um, to to history because that's always you know a, a good foundation to get started with is at the turn of the uh, 20th century as uh, electricity was being distributed throughout civilization so think of Thomas Edison and the light bulb think of um, the um, the 
power grid throughout um, Europe, throughout uh, the, the um, throughout the West, um, where the transformation meant that any technology that we had before, we could add power to it through the form of electricity. So a hammer became a jackhammer. A um, you know, a, a carriage became a car. Originally, the first cars were electric. Um, a, a screwdriver, you know, became a, a, a power tool, so on and so forth. And what we're doing right now is something similar, where at this point, we are adding uh, intelligence to just about anything that you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And because the intelligence at this point has gotten advanced to the point where it can um, emulate human communication, literally the, the answer is that like everything is going to be changed so so what i suggest people to be thinking about is to be taking their subject matter expertise and this is you know same with with most innovations right is to take your subject matter expertise takes what you find unique um what what makes you unique and to figure out how ai is going to be entering into it how is what you're going to be doing um going to be augmented uh by it and if if that is a little bit too broad, then then the the way that you break it down is you think through some sort of value added chain. I'm gonna assume that you either are an entrepreneur that has a business or are going into a business, and so you break down that that value chain of what that business would look like or or what that process is, and then think through every step of that value chain is is both adding value but also subtracting value because because costs accrue friction is added uh, miscommunications could be added but also you know theoretically value is added so you know in in e-commerce there's a point where they see the advertisement and they click on it then they, they put in the order button or so on and so forth at every one of those stages you can add in um different forms of ai to increase the efficiency and and decrease the the, the cost um and I, I guess I'll leave it there for now. I think I think there's also some interesting comments about what are the recent innovations in AI and what's coming down the pipeline, but I'll I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, we will come back there, but just you know, like uh, being the devil advocate here, right? So someone might say because you mentioned a very important, uh, I would say, phrase there, and you said it's like the moment is here and. You know, you did the similarity with previous things. Now, someone might say, Garrick, but, you know, the AI is not a new concept. AI has been with us now for some times. Why now all the hype is happening around AI? Is it because, you know, the generative AI, what we are seeing with tools like ChatGPT from OpenAI, Bart from Google, uh, MidJourney, and all these tools, like, why the hype happened now and not before, knowing that, and I covered this in one of my episodes of the history of AI, AI, you know, the, the concept goes back to very old times. And in computing, I mean, in modern ages, it started in the 50s, you know, in all this movement that happened in, in, in the universities across the US. But why now is the moment of AI? So in, in my opinion that there is a certain level of arbitrariness to it because the the technology that underpins a lot of the recent you know gizmos and and things that are, are being distributed in masses through you know bar chat gbt etc uh were based on an innovation um in 2017 from a paper called attention is all you need which was kind of a, a precursor paper to the transformer um and so the transformer is it, it's a fairly technical um concept that uh, was an innovation onto our existing, you know, understanding of how to use neural nets and how to use machine learning. And the fundamental, well, actually, I'd be very curious, Mehmet, if, if you're if you're familiar with, with Transformers, what what you what you were, your perspective would be on on what they added to the game, but from uh, what has been impactful for me about Transformers is that they unlocked a much greater degree of parallel processing amongst other things, which basically meant that we could be, we could do horizontal scaling with our machine models in a way that we couldn't do before. So all of a sudden it became a lot more tenable for us to uh, 
you know, consume 10% of the internet in order to create a model like GBT uh, 3.5, which was uh, the chat GBT, um, and, and it's, you know, billions of, of tokens or however many it was. So the, the Transformers had a lot of innovations. That was one of them. Another was that it Transformers allows you to chunk a piece of input data and to, as you consume that input data, to tell its context. So, so, so what I mean by that is uh, the original paper, Attention is all, is all You Need, was, was focusing on how to translate um, languages. So the example it gave was from, uh, from French to English. And various phrases in French you know, will have um, different sentence structure. So it's not mm -hmm. a one-to-one -one, you know, translation. Uh, you'll you'll have Yoda speak, um, and and the, the the grammar structure will be will be thrown off. So the the transformers were able to more efficiently discern that by being able to tell how the words existed and came together into sentences. So uh, long story short is that it could it could consume larger pieces of data and approach something to um, much closer like human ish understanding i wouldn't say that they they're anything like human in consciousness but they could they could um better understand larger volumes of data and parse the patterns between them so those were the two things so why did it not launch off in 2017 um in late 2017 when when that paper came out um you know i think it took about four four and a half years before um, enough engineers really understood the, the potential and really started to uh, build out the infrastructure to make ChatGPT. And then the quote unquote hype has been that um, ChatGPT was released and now anybody had access to it for free. They, they took a gander with having a billion dollars of funding from Microsoft. Now, most of that was in server server um, tokens, but putting that aside, they, they had a, a, a big investment enough to go mass public. And you know the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. People didn't know this technology technology was out there. And so it took that long before it, it hit mainstream. And, and uh, here we are. Yeah, I remember, uh, and this is now I'm not the devil advocate anymore. <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am who I am usually. Um, <laughs> I think I started to see like discussions online. And then I can't remember exactly how I came up with, because at first there was the API of what people knows now as chat gpt so yeah open ai they they released a a closed beta or closed platform and at that time you know like they put some use cases there and i was thinking like okay this is very interesting i'm not a coder but by any mean but of course i understand i have the knowledge okay so they did an api that you can give some input and then it gives you some output that's look interesting and then you know, in December or November, um, I believe, end of November, when they released ChatGPT, right? Oh man, like, <laughs> like yep. this is something that we never saw before. And now, to your point, Gary, and this is why now I'm not the devil advocate. <laughs> and I, I, I repeated multiple times why it is the moment, because, you know, the anyone that is familiar with computer science knows that you know. Uh, natural language processing and knows that you know having ability of a machine to understand a human like it's it's like the the paramount i would say theorem theory whatever you want to want problem that everyone wanted to solve and you know this breakthrough because you know I, i'm like you interested in ai from long time and the key for doing other things with AI, start by letting the machine understand actually what you want. So if I can let a machine understand what I'm thinking about, I can later go and tell the machine to go and do it because it can understand me. Now, taking this from this point, I want to understand from you and for the audience, of course, how this will affect the future of jobs, careers, and our lives from your point of view yeah i think that there's as as there always is with large amounts of change there's a lot of fear there's a lot of uncertainty um and it's it becomes quite hard to to you know 
for individuals who haven't been thinking about this stuff to to predict what's going to happen next. And I I think that the the two things that I I talk with people about who are worried about AI taking their jobs, disrupting their livelihood, is that uh, first of all, AI is not going to replace anybody. It's instead it's going to amplify some people to be so hyper productive that they're going to replace people. So in other words, your, your job's not going to be taken by an AI. It's going to be taken by someone who's using AI better than you. Um, yeah. And so in some industries, there are they are more constrained by supply than demand. What I mean by that is if if you talk with people in the tech world, you know, we kind of need 10 times more coders than we have right now. Like like this the constraint has been on the supply side. We want more code. We we um I would also argue that we want more art in the world. That, that there are a mm -hmm. lot of things that we have taken for granted the supply and demand curve are where they're at, but give it a few years and we're probably going to um, really find that the demand has increased exponentially. But of course, there are, there are other roles. Um, one that comes to mind is, um, you know, I believe McDonald's has recently started testing AI for their, um, for taking orders through at drive throughs and things like that. And so it's like, is that going to increase exponentially um, as well? There, there are some historical examples uh, such as with bank tellers back in the uh, in the in the 1980s, uh, when the ATM was introduced, we thought bank tellers were going to go out of business. Um, mm -hmm. They they were going to drop down by like one fifth because four fifths of their time was spent just punching papers and and doing things that ATMs can do. But when ATMs were popularized, in fact, bank tellers' jobs did not go down. They actually went up because then the banks wanted to really create more banks they wanted to create more outlets and so the bank teller job was was not was not affected the way we, we expected so i think that there's going to be a lot of um surprises in this journey but by taking advantage of this technology and not seeing it as a race with silicon valley but instead just a race with your industry as you already were doing you already were competing with people in your field now it's just there's a, there's a, a new uh a new tool in the tool belt, that's a much healthier way to look at it. The, the other piece of advice I give people is that when you are in a state of fear, we know this with, with neuroscience that the blood pools away from your neocortex and you're 32% less capable of making creative decisions and, and higher order executive decisions. And so um, I really encourage people to you know, it's 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 real advice to look on the bright side and to get excited for where this technology is going. Um, if you are if you're scared, if you're playing on defense, if you're going on the passive and trying to like weather this out, then you're not going to be at the level that that we uh, we really need you to be. Um, and so those are are generally how I I think about most people's tactics for for weathering things. Yeah, uh, on, on this point, um, what I would say, like fearing, uh, complaining, uh, I, I don't know, like all these words that I can think about which are negative, would not change anything. Like even we saw some of the big names, even in Silicon Valley, they signed a paper for stopping, you know, the research in, on AI. Like some people ask me, what do you think? I said, okay, look, if if... OpenAI or Google, uh, they don't go and make it. Someone else will come and make it because, you know, it's it's a matter of, as we call it in the tech world and, you know, in the consulting world, you need a proof of concept, right? So you need to proof of concept. And once you have the proof of concept succeeded, so we know yeah. we can do this. The genie's out of the bottle, so to speak. Exactly. So if Mehmet will not do it, Garrick tomorrow will go and do it. If Garrick doesn't do it, Someone else will come and do it because we know that it can work. So collecting, yeah, it's going to take some time with them, probably. I'm not sure. But we, with all the processing speed, you know, like building a large language model. Yeah, it needs time. It needs all this. It needs resources. But, you know, like I believe in six months time, we can see another open AI, for example. Right. That, that can yeah. do the same thing. I, 
are, have you followed the the leak with with a uh, llama from 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 the, the the facebook ai have you followed that yeah. story at all yeah, yeah. yes yeah so, so once that so uh uh, Facebook had their own large language model. Uh, they called it Llama, and it was it was leaked out. Um, but something really interesting has, which I did not predict, um, occurred, which is that once it leaked out to to the masses, um, the open source community has taken it and run with it, and they have found certain yes. certain efficiencies of how to create new large language mo models uh, with with using the Llama framework that are orders of magnitude more efficient. So while it costs a billion dollars in processing to create ChatGPT, um, we are we are now creating new large language models that are as good as GPT-3, not as good as GPT-4 yet, but are as good as GPT-3, which you know, is, is, is pretty much good enough um, on orders of magnitude less. Uh, I think Google came out with this paper, uh, Chinchilla, uh, mm -hmm. which which had some of the major breakthroughs that, that helped the open source community. And, and then and there's a few other um, breakthroughs they had as well. But at this point, what, from what I'm seeing is that people with a beefy enough home setup and a few, uh, few days of downtime can be creating these large language models, um, which I did not think. I thought the constraint was going to be a half a billion dollars on a server farm. Um, but at this point, truly, the, the, the genie's outside the bottle. And exactly. if anyone's interested in that, I would suggest the uh, the Google paper called um, I think it was called "We Have No Moat," and it was a leaked Google document. If you Google "We Have No Moat Google," and neither does OpenAI, you'll see mm -hmm. a, a leaked Google document that goes into a lot more detail on that. Yeah. So surprisingly, and you know, this is one um, an information to give to the audience if you are watching or you are listening to us. So it's my it's my top hit. Uh, episode actually on the show it get the highest number of uh, listening and i didn't put it on youtube because it was a solo recorded without camera but you know everyone started to also ping me about it when i covered auto gpt and this mm. is exactly you know like they used actually the the llama uh, open source right so so to do a yep. few things and uh, it's interesting now you mentioned getting something and i'll ask you this question not from technical perspective to just also shed some light on the you know like the future of work that we talked about now you always separated between gpt 3.5 and gpt 4 right yeah the reason is and i did also a um like a review kind of between bard and gpt 4 and always i repeat myself that to me gpt 4 has the ability and even if you have access to gpt 4 today you know they, like they i'm not sure if they still show it or not um OpenAI, they show you something like a, a score for the model. So, for example, yeah. GPT 3.5 is fast, GPT 4 like less fast, I mean, slow a little bit. And then you have reasoning, right? So, the reasoning part. Now, from an AI futurist perspective, like when we say reasoning, we mean someone that has the ability to come up with something that doesn't exist. Would AI be able to do that? That's a great question. You know, it's just for this one yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I, I guess, I guess, bottom line, I would say yes, because you know we just see how fast we're advancing and how many breakthroughs we're making. Um, how far is that in the future to come up with true creativity? It's hard to say, but but I will I will talk a little bit about what's the gap between where we are and that point. So I think we're going to cross it. Um, we're probably going to cross it this century, but I, I want to talk a little bit about what that gap is. So um, if you go to ChatGPT and you ask it, what's two plus two? It will give you the answer for. But if you ask it a very complex math, math or not complex, but, but but a very long math problem like what's you know five thousand trillion four hundred you know so on and so forth. Um, times an, an equally large ridiculous number. So a, num so, so a math problem that is not very popular online. It will give you a wrong number. And, and if you punch into a calculator, you will verify that it's a wrong number. But the first few digits will be correct. Mm -hmm. The last few digits will be correct of the new number. Yeah. So what, what it's doing there is it's recognizing patterns. It's not actually calculating the numbers. And this is kind of a weird 
a, a, a weird thing you have to get your head around that when you're asking it these questions it's not reasoning through the problem it's not calculating it even though it's a computer you expect a computer to calculate it for for christ's sake um but it's just recognizing patterns in the internet so if you ask what's two plus two it will have millions of examples of people saying two plus two equals four so it knows the answer is four but if you ask it a question it hasn't seen before even a math question that you could reason through with enough time um it will give a a wrong answer but it will get parts of it correct because it has already recognized a pattern that to get the first few digits and the last few digits of a very complex multiplication, it only has to look at the first few and the last few digits of, of the two, um, what do you call them, uh, component component numbers. Mm-hmm. So it is – the pattern recognizing has gotten us further than we thought, It, but it only has the illusion that it actually has a model of reality. So the, the way that I think about this is that there – us humans – when we are reasoning through things, we reason things both bottom up, where we have empirical, historical data of what we've seen, and 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 we have examples, but we also think through things top down. You can imagine something you've never seen before. Yeah. Um, and right now these technologies, they, and I would encourage people to to play around with this with ChatGPT is to like actually punch in some of these numbers. It's quite illuminating. Um what this technology is is it it has a illusion of top down thinking and it's um it's done that only through through bottom up and so i think that as we are developing better and better technologies for these ais to have internal simulated versions of reality so um we're creating like these virtual minds like physics simulations and and other things um that are a little bit more obeying the laws of physics so to speak i think we're going to get closer to a to an ai that's able to to do something a little more top down and that's going to be um quite exciting i think that's going to be what the next few innovations are transformers they've taken us further than we ever thought they would but they are going to peak out and we need a few more innovations a few new truly creative new innovations that no one's talking about yet we need a few more of those before we're really going to crack that problem but the question garrick is don't you think that always we need someone to punch this, um, as we call it, prompt? Like, who who gonna give the prompt to the AI? Is it like another AI that is giving that prompt? How it will work? So, you're you're asking, in like a hundred years from now, what's going to be the process of maximizing AI's utility? Yeah. Like, let, let me give you a more, um, like, straightforward uh, example. So, assuming that AI will have the power to come up with completely a new business model or a completely mm-hmm. new piece of software. Let's make it more yeah. simple. Okay. So, someone needs to tell whatever, the, you know, the model they are using that I need a software that I believe it should do one, two, three, four. And then, you know, the AI will go and write the code. The AI will do the UI. The AI will do the UX. But who is giving this Ignite to start, you know, the process? Yeah, you know, so if if we're talking about AI having greater and greater impact into the the real world, so, so like the idea is, you ask ChatGPT, make me a million dollar company. So it's basically like, you know, find a way to put a million dollars in my bank account right now and just make it happen. Yeah. Um, and you have, if everybody has access to that, then then a lot of things are going to start to break down, at least in, in terms of like what is the definition of some of these things. Like if, yeah. if, if everybody has infinite money, then money's less valuable, right? And we're still in a physical universe. So, you know, what we're aiming for is a post scarcity civilization where mm-hmm. where you know people are all given enough and 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 you know i think that star trek vision still is at the heart of a lot of <laughs> nerds like you and i trying to make the world a better place but you know as an ai futurist when i'm, when I'm looking at this stuff practically uh, we, we need to keep in mind that there there these technologies are existing in a physical universe and so if we are asking it questions like give me comparative power over other humans like make a trillion dollar company Mm -hmm. that 
if everybody has it, then it won't work because it's comparative value and the technology is democratized. So then the real game we have to play is like an infinite game where everybody has enough. Or B, one person has the only access to the super AI, and then they ask it to make a trillion dollar thing, and their AI is more powerful, so it works. Yeah. So th- it's it's one of those two scenarios, and I think that it's it's a really beautiful thing where we are right now. We and I hope it plays out that the philosophy that's underpinning a lot of these companies is that we want to democratize this company. We we don't want a few um, super players to do it. And so um, that that was the idea that OpenAI was founded with. Now, is it still living up to its ideals? You know, I think there's a debate to be had about that. But mm. the principles are still very much in the culture of the open source market, of, of a lot of people who work at OpenAI. You know, we're all just human beings at the end of the day. Um, and so I think I think it's it's really important that we keep that vision and that inspiration and that ideal at the forefront of this movement. So, but I can Does that see your question. <laughs> yes, and I can see Garrick like you are on the positive side of of, of the thinking, right? So you're optimistic. Yeah, I would I would say that generally speaking, um, the the realization that that's allowed me to be optimistic is to look at the writings of earlier centuries and to see what blind spots that mm-hmm. people had when they were so so confident and um to to see how much better we are off right now and to see how many of those pessimists were, were wrong um has has i think luckily happened enough times that there's a pattern we can recognize and that pattern can be extrapolated without just faith like like you know i think that there's questions we need to have about uh, gray goo and what if it's just a super replicator AI and, and, and et cetera. And I think that there's um there's rational, logical reason to be optimistic even about these uh more esoteric problems. But fundamentally I think there's a um there's a lot to be optimistic about on many dimensions. I'm on your side and just you know to I would say compliment what you mentioned, Garrick. Um I believe AI will because you you touched on that and you said maybe either we all be in an abundance and I believe this is this is the case. I believe all of us will be in abundance. Um, life will not be the same we are living it now. Of course, it will take maybe hundreds of years. I'm not sure. I'm hoping that it's less. Whereas, because the reason I'm saying this, because if anyone, you know, and we saw life examples, maybe it was like a joke. We saw this guy who went viral on Twitter and he did something. He called it the hustle GPT. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. But, but guess what? I, I have people that I know that uh, we follow each other. Even we were in cohort together and they did it. I mean, OK, it was a small scale, but they did something and it get them 500 bucks. And, you know, they said, OK, let's try to get 5000 bucks. Of course, if now you go and type, OK, I need a side hustle that make me one million dollar. It will not work. And actually, chat GPT will answer you. I think they tweaked something and they tell, tell you <laughs> I'm, an, <laughs> I'm just a, a language model and I cannot give you any financial advice but i mean this showed us again i call it proof of concept right so there's something called proof of concept that yes ai can generate ideas let me give you one more example and actually i was planning to do even a um, a demo or like maybe a walkthrough about it two days back and you know like you and i we share this geeky thing so I looked at, you know, my office here, I have a, a Raspberry Pi and I have a, a Arduino uh, awesome. sit, sitting here. And, you know, all of a sudden I said, hey, let me go to ChatGPT and ask, you know, give me some cool idea that no one maybe have done it. Of course, up to the knowledge that they had up to 2021. And guess what? It gave me really cool ideas. Like uh, maybe no one will be interested in, but when I start to read, oh, look at this, like, you know, it's suggesting me, you know, the idea, suggesting me the components that I need to have, uh, giving me step by step, you know, guide. And, and actually, it's funny enough. It's, it, it told me at the end, hey, like this is just, you know, a fun project, uh, do it yourself kind of thing. Even yeah. it suggested, you know, I, I said, okay, what can I do? He said, yeah, like you can uh, put it into a website for hobbyists who would like, so you can put these ideas that I'm giving you. I said, okay. 
So this is the augmentation, guys, that, you know, I'm enjoying now. So if you are always thinking, ah, oh, this is going to take my job, you know, like this will end the world. No, nothing like this. Nothing like this will happen. Actually, you just need to have fun. And actually, I was not very fan of, you know, like uh, Reels and TikTok and all these things. But now when you go that side, you see like there are a bunch of people, young people, who actually are getting educated on AI and they are using it somehow either to create content or to do something which is very, very positive. Now, we, we you wanted to say something and we kept it aside for the use cases, uh, Garrick. Like, the most, I mean, close ones that we can see in the near future, like where we're going to see the, the changes fast. And when I say fast, we are not talking about years, maybe in the coming six to 12 months. And then down the road, how you can break down that to us. Yeah. So so one thing that's going to be coming out very soon is I think we're going to have a lot of companies that are going to be producing better interfaces with, with, uh, with this technology. So... If if you start if you start using ChatGPT um, not just for fun but actually for your work, you'll often find that the you know the hard part was figuring out how to describe the problem. You know who would have thought it? The questions was harder than the answer. Um, you, know, right. you can ask it to make a big report, but telling it what to make a report on, who is it for, what's the relevant you know uh, factors, you know that's the hard part. So I think we're going to be creating better and better interfaces to reduce the the effort of of those parts um so there's big communities right now that are uh trading and selling uh, prompts uh they you know yeah. they call themselves prompt engineers and prompt marketplaces i think that that is just in the very very early days and, and probably will look nothing like a marketplace in, in the coming years but uh, i think a lot of people are going to make a, a pretty penny um creating better interfaces i'm, I'm thinking of like Jasper AI and writer.ai oh. and those tools. It's really just is using ChatGPT on the back end, but they're, they, they create a, a, an interface that makes it easier to extract good copy. Um, that's number one. Number two is that the, the AIs that are being produced by like Bard uh, with Google and ChatGPT with OpenAI are very general in their knowledge. And a, a, go, -to tech, a go to startup is going to be to create a specialized AI that performs very well in a subfield. So think of a legal AI. Right now that um, the problem is that AI hallucinates and you can't have that in, in a legal profession or a medical profession. So by creating finely tuned AIs that make less mistakes and are less generic, um, I think a lot of value is gonna be added to the market and a lot of very successful startups are gonna be born. Um, I'll tell you one pet project that I'm excited for. I'm excited for a AI that scrapes every piece of text from a variety of, let's call them gurus, like mentors, like Steve Jobs, et cetera, um, and mm. then uh, creates an AI persona so that you can have a conversation of asking Steve Jobs, hey, what would you do? And it takes every transcript, every conversation from that per guy, every interview, um, and you can have Steve Jobs or anyone as your, your business mentor. That's an example of an AI that, becomes fine-tuned and narrowed down uh, with with the right data inputted. So those are, are two, there's a few others, but those are two fundamental lenses I, I like to, to put on and, and advise people to put on when thinking of new companies and new um, innovations still to be created. Um, but Garrick, are we going to see, like, only, like for example, historically, it seems like we, 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 we are tied to two big names all the time. So it was... Apple, Microsoft, um, I don't know, like uh, we have all these two um, big names. So here now we have now Microsoft in you know, open AI backed by Microsoft yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus, versus, versus Google. Uh, are we going to see like this consolidation? And the reason I'm asking you, because nowadays, like even new startups are coming up and there's this famous meme on the internet when they, <laughs> you know, when they remove the, 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 the cover, it's like uh, running on, on top of, uh, of open AI API. Yep. Or maybe Google still didn't release a, an API for Bard, but I'm sure they're going to do that very soon. Yep. And the reason why I'm asking you, like, don't you think that actually these two companies will have huge impact 
um, and control over any startup that will come uh, in the future like and how we can tackle that actually yeah that that that's a, a great point and you know i think that there is a a tendency for um, a lot of companies become, sorry, a lot of industries become duopolies, you know, PlayStation versus Xbox, um, so on and so forth. And it's the AI wars are, are really shaping up for Google and Microsoft to be um, really going head to head. Um, Apple is, because they like to be very insular, are not using the word AI in any of their press releases. They're using words machine learning, transformers, etc. But they're avoiding that word because they don't want to hitch their brand to to that. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of players that are pretty big that are maybe not the center of attention in this. Um, but even more importantly, I want to go back to what we were saying in the middle of today's conversation, which is the open source community with the innovation mm -hmm. from Llama uh, being being um, leaked and uh, the innovations with Chinchilla and and um, low low input training, which uh, is meaning that this technology is becoming a lot more democratized through through developers building building custom apps that are not tied at all to either of these big players. So I think that um, it's very natural for a lot of industries to have duopolies, and I think that we will have something like that. But enough options that we won't find ourselves in some sort of nightmare scenario where um, a uh, a shadow monopoly actually um, dominates too much. And I wouldn't yeah. have said that even three months ago until until uh, the the realizations from that white paper. Once again, recommend you know we have no moat from from Google. I uh, would definitely recommend checking that out for for more uh, evidence for that. Yeah, 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 and I, you're right. Like things are changing so fast because what maybe I've said uh, even one month back, it, <laughs> it doesn't apply anymore. Um, you mentioned something about coding, and I'm interested. Like, when we can expect a proper, full-fledged code generated by AI? Because now. You know the feedback so far that it's not the perfect code it still need you know people to go and check it back of course always this is why we will need for example quality in, uh, engineers and we need like q and a and all this stuff but like really like when you think the ai will be able to generate proper code uh, you know is it any 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 near future yeah that's that's a fantastic question it's it, there's not going to be a single moment, you know. I'm not sure if if uh, if people think of it this way, but I remember when Siri first came out and everybody said it was terrible, and they weren't yeah. impressed. And then five years later, Siri just works, and then people are like, "Well, of course it works. It's been around for five years." And there was never a moment of like, "Ah, you know, it's 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 quote unquote arrived." And right now, uh, the Copilot tool um, that mm. Microsoft has for it's a, it's a GitHub product. Um, already, they have noted that I think more than 50% of all code committed in this year has been written with Copilot, um, which does not mean 50% of developers are using it. It means that 10% of developers are paying $8 a month are writing five times more code than anyone else. Um, so, so really what we're looking at is still in the beginning stages of, like we said before, people being amplified, not, not AI taking your job, but people being amplified, becoming more productive. And yeah. um, I think that that's kind of what, I think that's really what's going to look like for, for a, a decent amount of time. And we're, we're probably pretty far away from the idea of you just typing in, hey, make me a million dollar, you know, uh, startup. Um, it's, it's just not gonna, gonna happen that way, um, at least while we're constrained by physics. So I, I think it's a, a long, a long journey with, with a lot of little micro milestones and probably was not gonna, I, as an AI futurist, I'm not hitching my my um, my planning around that uh, anytime soon. Okay, um, just to put context, and maybe if there's anyone who doesn't uh, understand like how coding works, um, and to your point, Gary. So when 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 programming languages were created, so they were just you know putting on top of some. Uh, assembly language just for the sake of a programmer to write a piece of software in a human understandable format. And then, you know, with time, the code 
you know, grew. I mean, it start to have more libraries that people can reuse. Why I'm mentioning this? The reason I'm mentioning this, because this is remind us of how large language models, if you are today, you are not a geeky guy, you are not a coder. So the way large language models works is they have a huge amount of data sitting somewhere. And then when you go and put the question, like even if you are just saying, hey, um, give me a, um, I don't know, write me an essay about a construction business. So it goes search, you know, what information, same as you used to do in the past, or used to go to books and then go to articles and then try to rename, rewrite it in your own way. So this is what AI does. Now, connecting that to, to, to code, so actually we have a library of code that AI can understand what it does. So if I go and today say to chat GPT, I want a function that written in Python, I need to specify, of course, the language. I need a Python yeah. code that goes and, for example, check a website if it's up or down, check how much is the page load speed, and uh, put that into a specific format output it to a text file for example just because we are thinking non-ui now yeah. so what 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 op what uh, open ai chat gpt will do it will go and find okay which functions within the programming language with python can do that and then it will write it for you maybe it's not the ultimate way what garrick mentioned is that it requires time because they need to train the more data you have and the more you use it and the more feedback you give it becomes better because it's what they call a supervised model so basically you need to keep to keep giving feedback to it so it can um, you know interact better with you and just for the sake of of the audience here because i've been using chat gpt's maybe one week after it went out the thing is that because they can collect data and we know that they can collect data about all our interactions. And I can tell you, even with the same prompt that I used to have three months back or four months back, if I use the same ones now, I got much better answer because they know better about yeah. me and what are my needs. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I, I want to share one, I want to share one, yeah, one uh, thought just on, on that point of it, it learning. Uh, we're going to, you know, people talk about prompt engineering becoming a new job description. I think we're going to have a new job description in the future as well, which is, which is it? Um, large language model um, optimization, which is uh, the same as SEO and ASO, which yes. is going to be what if you, you know, people, you, you ask, hey, what's, what's a pizza place? Or give me a list of 10 pizza places. And you prompt it so often to include mom and pop shop in Atlanta that all of a sudden mom and pop shop Atlanta shows up in more people's queries. Already, I have some friends who are um, uh, working on this to to influence other people's answers to questions oh. by how they train um, they they're training the model. Now, of course, that's going to become an arms race. You know, SEO never SEO is still a work in progress. It's a constantly dynamic system. It doesn't it doesn't really hit equilibrium, so to speak. So, like, it's just going to be another another vector of of uh, of, of games to play, but uh, that is going to become another, I believe, uh, industry on top of SEO and on top of prompt engineering and and, and all the, the future holds. Yeah, on, on the prompt engineering, before I forget, because uh, you, you talked about, you know, people doing prompts and trading prompts. So actually this space, guys, if you're thinking to keep this business model, I don't advise you at all because, and I mentioned this in a previous episode, a couple of days back, um, this is being sorted out by AI itself. So you mentioned Garrick, uh, Jasper AI and Jasper yep. AI, they have a function. So if you missed that episode, I'm repeating it now and I'm not affiliated with them. I just use them as well. So Jasper AI, they get a really cool function where when you type the prompt, when you type what you want to do, is it like a blog post or whatever? They have a button now, enhance it, enhance. So when you click on enhance, I'll give you a very simple example. If I say I need a tweet, uh, let's make it a little bit more. Uh, I need a LinkedIn post about sharing um, a new product with the market. And when I write this phrase and I hit the enhance button, what Jasper AI would do, it will go change my 
prompt and to write something like this. You are a marketing specialist in social media and I want you to write, you know, like it make it much longer the way that you yeah. should interact actually with large language models. And when I saw this, I said, what? <laughs> like yep. we don't need, we not, we don't need to, to enhance the prompts anymore. I mean, there's a, an AI that can do this. So um, as we are coming I, a little bit I, to, to I, yeah. I think I think there's a lot of a, a lot to be said there. I know we're we're wrapping up, but I think there there's a prompt engineering is definitely going to go through a lot of transformations. Um, fundamentally, we're still constrained by physics, and then different skill sets put some people in better situations than others. So I think that uh, I don't know if I would say it's wasted effort, but certainly is not going to be anything like what it is right now. I completely agree with that. Hundred percent. Um... One thing I want to ask you, Greg, like maybe, maybe people now who are listening to us, they are saying, hey, these two guys, what are they, <laughs> what they are talking about? But we are interested in AI. We want to, to get involved in this, in this AI thing. Um, whether it's like a, from a career perspective, maybe they want to start a company or maybe it's just a hobby. So what advice or resources would you recommend for these individuals? Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I, I tell everybody who is interested in going to AI is to check out playground.openai.com, uh, which is where they show off the the hidden variables um, about how their their large language model actually accepts inputs. So if you're just doing ChatGPT, you're, you're you're missing big chunks of the story. So I would I suggest most people who want to get maybe not fully technical, maybe they don't want to code, but they do want to understand the AI on a on a more intimate level than than they would just by playing around with it uh, to, to check out playground.openai. Um, and if you're interested in starting a, a company, uh, my company Valhalla.team is right now looking for partners to start new ventures. Our, our mission is to be uh, creating uh, AI based SaaS companies to uh, build up and then exit from in two to three years. So we're looking for, for partners and um, businesses. Uh, so um, anyone who wants to can, can reach out to us. But if you're just starting as a, as a hobbyist, I definitely recommend uh, reading more of the open AI documentation and playing with their playground. Great. It's good that you mentioned this because uh, uh, this is something I ask. So I'm going to put you know the website uh, of the company in the episode description. And of course, I will put also the profile uh, access to Garrick so you can get in touch with him. Garrick, like, this is my famous last question nowadays. What is the question that you wished me to ask you and how you would answer it? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, Mehmet, I felt like you were a fantastic interviewer. Let me just let me just uh, go back to you oh. and, and compliment. Oh. This was, oh, this was been a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, I decided to go a lot more technical than I, than I normally do with you know, the CTO show. And, and you were um, fantastic to, to talk with and, and exchange with. So uh, great, great job. Oh, um, thank the, you. My pleasure. Um, the question of what I wish you had asked. I think we covered most everything. I don't know what the question would have been. Um, I I love talking about the future of AI. I think there's a lot to be learned from how it's from looking at Darwinian evolution, from looking at how biology has has been solving similar problems over billions of years, and how we're we're, we're now solving similar problems with AI with similar results. Um, so maybe maybe if we do a, a follow up episode we'll, we'll talk more about oh, about that sure. um but no this this has been fantastic we met and and i think we pretty much covered everything that we wanted to okay great that i'm, I'm really happy garrick like i'm really thrilled to have you today uh on the show because i think you shed light on a lot of aspects that people have thought okay how the future looks like and from you know hearing from someone like you it would be really enlightening for the audience Thank you very much for being on the show today. And uh, guys, like as usual, as I end every episode, like if you have any questions to Garrick or to me, you can reach out to us. Um, for me, you can reach out to me by email, LinkedIn or Twitter, where I'm the most active. If it's the first time you are watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe to the channel. We are always having, you know, superior content, like great interviews with CEOs, subject matter experts, and you are hearing about all the new technology from AI to emerging technologies and all the rest. 
And if you are listening on your favorite podcasting platform, also don't forget to leave us a review and also subscribe to the podcast. And if you are interested to be like Garrick today, to be a guest, I would love to discuss this with you. Like this is how actually we are growing the show more and more. And I will be discussing that with you one to one. Of course, we can choose the topic, the format, the time, the date. We can arrange for all of that. And don't forget also to leave us a review. I uh, would appreciate this. And until we meet in next episode, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Thank you, Mehmet. Oh. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.